It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means. It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Yeah! Uh, thank you, fake audience. Thank you, fake band. Stopped on a dime. Man, those guys are tight. How are you guys? Let me get the chat room open here. Here we go. All right. Hello, Mary Band, Gloria, Musical Lucy, Mark Doyle, Ken, Jesse, Mary Band, Made You Look, Robbie, McGath. How are you guys? Good to see you. Hope you all had a great weekend. So contrary to what I said at the end of last week's show, we are not going to do a show this week about building a hip-hop track because I haven't heard back from Chuck Henry yet. He was going to be my uh, guinea pig for this episode. I know he does that stuff really well, and he lives eh, uh, probably half an hour from uh, the office. So I reached out to him, and I didn't hear back from him, which is not like Chuck. So maybe he's on vacation out of the country? I don't know. So uh, as soon as I hear back from him, we will, in fact, do that. But I I've been keeping a running list of things that we see, that we hear, uh, stuff that we see at the road rally. Uh, and that's why I'm doing a show called 20 Things That Can Hurt Your Music Career This Week. Um, oh, I've got a hangnail. I have to deal with that off air. Don't want to be unprofessional. God forbid I'm unprofessional. Um, so 20 things that can hurt your music career. Um, some of these we've talked about before. Some of these we probably haven't mentioned. But uh, it's important stuff to know, and a lot of it is common sense, yet people still sometimes do these things. And so here they come um, in no particular order. I just did them kind of uh, however I had them written down, didn't reorder them. Um, and at the end of this, I'm also going to do um, Ask Michael Anything because we'll probably have some time left over, and I haven't done one of those in a while. So here we go. The first of 20 things that you can do to hurt your music career are doing, um, uh, there's no better way to describe it other than what I would call lame edit points. Um, so many of our listings, <laughs> I feel a sneeze coming out. <laughs> All right, hopefully it will abate. Um, <laughs> I put on my, my pre-show makeup. Always makes me want to sneeze. Anyway, uh, a lot of the listings, especially for instrumental stuff for film and TV, uh, will mention that uh, it's a good idea to have easy edit points in your track. Well, I've personally heard a lot of stuff. Actually, I hear it uh, when I review stuff sometimes before we do an episode of Taxi TV. Um, some people think that that means an easy edit point means that you need to take a full one beat whole note rest and it just sounds really bad and it doesn't mean that uh, i mean there are certainly circumstances where you could have a nice rest in there but more often than not it just means an obvious edit point and things that you edit on are usually things like a kick drum or a snare drum something that's a hard thing um, back in my day we would take quarter inch tape and go eh, 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 and rock it back and forth over the playhead mark it with a grease pencil pull it out lay it in the editing block and cut it with a, a razor blade then stick it together with a piece of tape but now Obviously, with uh, digital, you can just look for the beats, see them in the waveform, and cut on them. So, like a legato violin part or a flute part, going to be tough to edit on. Although, a solo piano thing, uh, you could have a big note that's easy to edit on. So, that's all it means. It, is, it doesn't mean put in a whole note rest because your minute or two minute long instrumental track is going to sound really goofy if uh, you know every eight bars, every 16 bars, or what have you, there's a full rest in there, a whole note rest. It just sounds clunky. And I understand that people are doing it trying to make an easy edit point. Doesn't have to be that easy. So there you go. That's number one. Um, Number two, 
when they ask, sometimes uh, when a library hears a song that you've got and they've received it from Taxi and they like it and they send you an email, hey Bob, uh, I really like this song, I'd like to offer you a deal to put this song in my library. Um, by the way, do you also have an instrumental mix or a mix uh, minus vocal? The mistake that people frequently make is looking at their mix bus or their two mix out meters. And when you take the vocal out of a song, uh, especially if the vocal is pretty prominent in the mix, those meters are going to drop down. So people will compensate by bringing up their master fader two or three dBs to compensate for what they see, which is the meters on the mix bus are lower. But when you do that, it defeats the purpose uh, for the reason that they're asking for the mix minus vocal. And the reason they're asking for a mix minus vocal is that they may want to only use the first lyric line of the chorus um, and then cut to the mix minus vocal for the instrumental version of it and then cut back to maybe the last lyric line of the chorus. In other words, they'll do an edit to take out the vocal so that the dialogue can come up and be heard easily in that section. That's a pretty rudimentary example that I just gave, but it's a good example. So if you've given them um, Let's, if you've given them a mix with vocal, let's say that your meters are hitting zero and the mix minus vocal is at minus two, um, that's okay because the instrumentation is still going to be equal. So they can cut back and forth between the two and be fine. Whereas if you bring down uh, or bring up the master fader, to compensate for the lack of vocal adding to the cumulative level of the track, then when they cut to the instrumental, it's going to jump right up. And then when they cut back from the instrumental back to the vocal, it's going to drop back down again. So anytime somebody asks you for a mix minus vocal, then just mute the vocal fader or channel and let the mix happen. And don't worry about compensating for the mix bus levels. Make sense? Hopefully. I made sense there. Um, oh, I'm reading the, the chat room. I can't get distracted. All right. Uh, number three is trying to show what a virtuoso you are when what they really need is something that sets a mood, establishes a place or a time period, and is typically simple, musically simple, and stays out of the way of dialogue. The music is rarely the star of the scene. So the mistake that people make is thinking to them, the, I understand, the person who is the creator, the writer, the composer of that piece of music, they're very proud of that, and they want people to know how talented they are. I completely understand that. But more often than not, the people on the receiving end, on the end user end, that are putting music in a TV show or a film or a commercial, they really want something. The most important thing for them is that it supports a mood or it establishes um, a time or a place. I think I wrote an article uh, about this in the last Taxi newsletter that very frequently, uh, you know, let's use the, I think I mentioned it's on Taxi TV not long ago, when uh, it's a dusty, gritty, dirty, greasy biker bar scene. Uh, they want a piece of music that when they cut to the scene and you hear a few seconds of music, you already know it's a biker bar because you're seeing an interior shot of the biker bar. And obviously, if you heard like ballerina music or opera or classical, it's going to be incongruous with what you're seeing. So you want, uh, you know, blues rock or southern rock or something that is going to help establish the place. Same thing could be said for establishing a time period. If uh, the movie takes place in 1974, um, you would want something like Captain and Tennille Love Will Keep Us Together uh, blasting from the jukebox in the background. That tells your brain, oh, that's the 70s. But what they're not looking for is something that is virtuoso-like because it's liable to be overly complex. Um, 
and as much as we all want to show the very best that we that we can do, uh, what's the uh, acronym? Uh, Kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. Right? Not that I'm calling you stupid, but you should keep it simple. I'd much rather see people crank out something that's simple and has a, a nice, memorable melody, but you don't want it to be so complex or even so unbelievably hooky that it distracts the the viewers from the dialogue and what's going on in the scene. So remember, music is not the star. It is the support system for the emotion. Um, and that's what your job is. So keep it simple whenever possible. All right, a little water might be in order. Okay, um, I think it was Two weeks ago, uh, I was reviewing some music. No, it wasn't for the show. There was some music going to a music supervisor who's a good friend of mine. And I wanted to hear the forwards um, that the screeners had picked before they went out. And one of the pieces that I heard was reasonably good. Uh, the same composer, same artist, had three or four other pieces that were in the group of forwards, maybe a couple of other pieces. And they were actually better musically and more in line with what the supervisor needed. The third piece wasn't as strong as the other two, but the thing that was really a turnoff was the level was so low, the level of the audio compared to everything else that we were forwarding and compared to the other two or three that this person um, was getting forwarded, the levels were so low that the supervisor would have done what I did, which was what? What's, what? Yeah, I had to turn around and actually crank the volume up to about three quarters on my stereo um, in order to bring it up to the level of everything else. So always a good idea um, to play your music and, you know, throw it in iTunes and, and play it, uh, play something else that you know well in iTunes, then play your thing and then play something else after it and see if your level is competitive or equal to or in the ballpark of the other pieces of music because it it will put you at a disadvantage. And I know you think, well, why don't they just turn it up? Um, and there are cases where we've heard something spectacular here then we've got to go uh, take that piece of music uh, if we want to forward it. If the levels are really, really low, we've got to take that piece of music and then throw it into GarageBand or Pro Tools or what have you and make a copy of it and boost the levels on it. Um, but if you're doing that you know, 20 or 30 times a day, not optimal. If you're a music supervisor, uh, even a library owner, and you get something where the levels are just so low, it, it, it's, it's a turnoff. And I know it seems petty, but it's real. Just got to trust me on that. Um, make your levels equal to everything in the world around you. Um, okay, I keep getting distracted by the chat room. Uh, oh, here's a doozy. Um, I had this happen recently. Uh, somebody, a taxi member, sent me something... Um, I can't remember why. I think it was somebody that I'm fairly friendly with, and they just wanted me to hear a piece of music, and they said, is it okay if I send you an MP3? And I said, sure. So I got the, <laughs> I got the email, and it said there was an MP3 attached, and it looked like an MP3. In fact, it was an MP3, but you know what it was? It was a blank MP3. There was no music anywhere in that file. There was some sort of little glitch at the top, so I don't know what kind of technical problem this person had uh, when they were putting it together, but clearly what they hadn't done is something that's been critical to do, um, dating back to the days of sending cassettes out in the industry, and then certainly uh, in the days of sending CDs out, and it still holds true today, that no matter when you're sending music out, always make sure that that file actually has something that's playable. And it's a good time to check your level, too. So, yeah, the last thing you want to do is send an empty file. Okay. Um, moving right along, we're already on number six. Poorly titling your song or track. Um, 
this is an actual title on something that I just saw when I was putting this list together. The song, uh, the title was Rising Sun Sunday Mix Plus One Vox Level. That was the title. Now, I understand when you save the file on your end that you want to know what it is that you've, sa that you've saved. Um, this is great for your purposes, for searching for it, for filing it, but not when you send it to the industry. And I know I've harped and harped on this for the five years that we've been doing Taxi TV, but people still do it, and I know that we get new viewers all the time. So those of you who are new viewers that don't know this yet, just give us the title. Um, Rising Sun should be the title, not Rising Sun, Sunday Mix, plus one Vox level. People in the industry see that and they go, okay, this person, not all that professional, and you've already tainted their opinion of you before they've heard the music. And as much as we'd like to think that the music speaks for itself and only for itself, or only the music speaks for itself, you know what I'm trying to say, um, little things like this are basically, uh, they telegraph to the end user that you may not be all that professional, and they do want to deal with professionals. Number seven, uh, not sending emails, voicemails, or letters that can come back to bite you on the butt later. Um, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm not going to mention any names, but this is somebody who I see at the road rally, I, I've seen this person many, many times at the road rally. Um, I have this person um, has some classic music, vintage music that was big back in the 50s or 60s. And I'm trying to think of a kind way, uh, an appropriate way to, to frame this. Um, anyway. This person has sent emails to the staff at Taxi saying, hey, you know, uh, Michael hasn't answered my emails. Well, they didn't get to me. For whatever reason, um, maybe this person was sending a lot of emails. Maybe there was something in the emails where the people who, you know, would forward that to me from the staff are going, geesh, this person's like, a, you know, a little off. Maybe I shouldn't send this to Michael. For whatever reason, I never got any emails from this person, nor had I ever gotten any phone calls. So this person got a renewal notice from Taxi and wrote back and uh, was a little less than kind, saying, you know, you guys uh, never forward my emails to Michael. He hasn't done anything for me, blah, 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 blah. What this person doesn't know, and there's no way that this person would know this, but behind the scenes, on several occasions, I have given this person's music to publishers I know in the industry that are looking for vintage stuff where the artist slash composer owns both the copyright, owns or controls the copyright and the master recording. So on several occasions of my own volition, I have tried to do a little extra nice thing for this person behind the scenes. And I don't send out emails or make phone calls every time I do that because I do it a lot. And frankly, I don't have the time to pick up the phone or send an email every time I do a little solid for somebody like that. I don't want, um, I don't have the time for, to engage them in, oh, really? That was so nice of you. Thank you. First of all, I'm not looking for any praise or, or thank yous, but frequently those phone calls turn into, oh, so tell me more about this person. Um, sometimes it leads to them Googling the person. Sometimes it leads to them following up with the person, which is another thing I'm going to get to. So I generally don't tell somebody, by the way, I've reached out to somebody on your behalf. Well, this person sent, you know, less than kind email. Um, I mean, really kind of bashing Taxi, uh, not so much me personally, but bashing the company. And I thought, you know what? I, I would have sent this person's music to the appropriate people, um, had the occasion arisen, whether the person remained a member or not. Uh, there are plenty of former Taxi members that have gotten deals because four years after they've been a member, I've been in a situation where I remembered their piece of music, had a copy of it here, and sent it to somebody in the industry because it was the right thing to send and they ended up getting a deal. So I am not very likely 
to do that for this person after the snippy uh, email that we recently got. So never send an email or leave a voicemail or send a letter or put in a post up in social media, send out a tweet or put something on Facebook that bashes anybody in the industry because it can and it probably will at some point come back to bite you on the butt. Um, I know people get rather perturbed and in the heat of the moment um, they send something I, I do get some pretty nasty emails. Um, those of you who have known me for a long time know that I get a lot of them from frustrated people. And inevitably, when I call them, they're very apologetic and very kind. And they say, oh, geez, you know, I'm so sorry I sent that. Um, gee, I wish I, I, I had a guy that uh, sent a thing off to the Better Business Bureau. He never asked taxi for a refund, never complained to us about anything, was ticked off about a critique and uh, posted a complaint with the Better Business Bureau. The taxi was a scam. And I called the guy up and I said, dude, you didn't even reach out to us first. He said, yeah, you know, it was just, it was in the heat of the moment. I'm sorry, I feel bad. Uh, I'll reach back out to the Better Business Bureau and ask them to take down the complaint, which they don't. So yeah, that's on our permanent record now. So don't, anytime you're frustrated and pissed off, wait 24 hours before you act on it. Um, and that 6,000 member number is actually a little low. Um, I just saw that go by. Uh, that number is low. Anyway, where am I? Number eight, putting an old copyright date on your music. This one, um, it's pretty darn important. Um, there are some exceptions maybe, but here's why you don't do it. If I'm trying to think of different circumstances in the record industry, in the record side of the industry, um, when you send out something that's got a copyright, let's say 2011, 2009, um, it, makes it look like the song has kind of outlived its sell-by date. Um, it's like, geez, nothing's, you know, you wrote this song eight years ago, nothing has happened. Um, so I would just put uh, the copyright symbol and your name if the date is more than a year or two. I remember it was, I think it was John Brahaney that first hipped me to that. So and the same thing is probably true for the film and TV industry, except I would say that you want to include it um, if they're looking for vintage music and uh, your thing, you know, is copyright 1967, then leave that on there because they want to know that it is vintage and it was copyright copyrighted back then. Um, okay. Uh, Number nine, putting your info on your CD or even in your EPK, your electronic press kit, that you graduated from the Guitar Institute, let's say, 20 years ago, um, really isn't going to impress them. And I see this a lot. Um, I see it frequently in people's bios. Um, I, I've seen it in other places. I've seen people actually attach a note, you know, where somebody is looking, let's say, for, um, let's say somebody's looking for a Steve Vai like guitar instrumental for a TV show. All right. And the person will actually include something that says, uh, you know, their name, the title, and then in parentheses, graduated from Guitar Institute, 1978. I don't believe that there's a music supervisor anywhere in the industry that's going to go, awesome, this dude graduated from Guitar Institute in 1978 and be so impressed that they're going to be more interested in that person because of that or, or, or sign that piece of music or, or place it because of that. So it's... It, it doesn't look very professional, so don't do that, okay? Do not put, oh, uh, I actually saw one, and I can't hold it up anyway, I wouldn't want to embarrass anybody, but I actually, what made me think of this was I saw a CD the other day that actually said, um, 
graduated from, I think it was Musicians Institute or Guitar Institute, whatever it was. It was like a one line thing on the back of the CD. And I just thought, nobody in the industry really needs to know that. Um, okay, number 10, moving right along. Uh, putting a bad photo on your CD cover. We have seen some doozies <laughs> over 24 years of taxi, um, especially if you're doing music for film and TV. Um, you could make an argument that if you're an extremely attractive person, maybe it would catch their attention, but let's face it, they're more interested in the music. Uh, if it's an artist pitch, they want to see what you look like because they want to see if the image matches the music. Okay, and the industry is shallow, and they do like attractive people. Um, not to say, actually, I'm a little bit heartened by the fact that there have been some people signed and successful in the last few years that are not the typical young, gorgeous people that typically used to get signed. Um, the industry is being a little more flexible about that, and they are now signing people who just make great music. But in the context of pitching for film and television, um, you they don't care what you look like. They only care about the music. And chances are you can turn them off. Uh, you know, if you're... Nah, I'm not even going to go there. Let's just say you don't need to put a picture on if you're pitching for film and TV. You certainly don't need to put a picture on one that's been permanently emblazoned in my noggin for all these years. Some guy standing in front of a rack full of gear playing guitar with his shirt off. Um, and he looked like a very dated gentleman. Uh, he looked like he was kind of stuck in the late 70s, maybe early 80s, might have had a mullet and was shirtless with his guitar strapped on, clearly posing, and was posed in front of a rack full of gear. Like, check me out. I'm a rockin' guitar player, and look at all my gear. Nobody wants to see that. Uh, well, there's so many ways I could go with that, but I won't. So, um, oh, another one that would fall in that category. You'd be shocked how many people... Um, put pictures, I'm trying to think, I've got one of myself around here somewhere, uh, where I am buck-toothed, pre-braces, and wearing a really bad madras plaid shirt. I was probably about nine or ten years old, playing guitar. It was uh, like a yearbook photo taken for the Evelyn Brew School of Guitar Annual Musical Review. And of course, every parent had to get a copy of that picture. We see people that actually send those pictures in or put them on their CD cover or put them in with their bio. And it's almost as if they're trying to say, look how long I've been making music. Therefore, I'm good. People in the industry have seen that photo way too many times. There was actually a member whose name I won't mention years ago, and I'm talking probably in the mid-90s, um, it was a female member, and there was a shot of her, I believe, sitting on a toilet holding a little toy guitar or a ukulele. Ain't that cute? But it's not something that's going to motivate somebody in the industry to go, wow, check that cool picture out. I think I'll sign this artist. So uh, don't do that. Also, don't take a picture uh, that... If you're doing an artist pitch and you've got a great shot of yourself from 1992 and you were younger and less wrinkly and more attractive back then, putting that out there with your bio today or your EPK or your CD cover, um, if somebody is interested in signing you and then they meet you and they go, you know, it's like a dating site. <laughs> I just saw an episode some TV show where they were talking about this, uh, people putting stuff up on Tinder or whatever. And uh, the photo this person was putting up was when they were much younger. And then, of course, they would go on a blind date and the person that met them said, hey, you don't look anything like you did in your photo. So the industry reacts pretty much the same way. <laughs> Metri Steve says, what's wrong with a mullet? Um... I don't know, I'm not going to say anything. I, I get nasty emails from people when I comment like that, so I'm just going to leave out my mullet comment. All right, 
Here's another big no-no, uh, and I saw an example of this about a week ago, handing out a thumb drive or a CD with rough mixes on it. Um, it's better to not hand out anything at all than give somebody rough mixes. Um, if you were a fine artist, would you, you know, like pitch yourself to a, a museum or a gallery by saying, you know, Here, here's a charcoal sketch I did of the painting uh, that I'm working on. No, you wait till the painting is done, and the same thing would be true with your mixes. Wait until you've got your final mixes. Don't give them a rough mix. Why would you do that? People do it all the time. And this takes me to the next one on my list, which is number 12, which is handing out. I actually saw this, I think it was about a week ago, a CD that actually said rough mix in big like headline size letters on the CD cover rough mix. So it was bad enough that it was a rough mix, advertising it on the CD cover. Yikes. All right, here's another one that I saw not that long ago. A very lengthy explanation. Uh, there were two songs on the CD, and there, were, uh, there was a paragraph for each of the two songs on the back of the CD explaining what the songs were about in excruciating detail. And, of course, they were both relationship songs. And it was like, you know, this one was about when my girlfriend left me for the second time. And she and her kids were living with me for three years. And I felt like they were my kids. So it was really painful. I felt for this person. I really did. I, I could feel the pain coming off of the printed words. But bad move. If you've got to explain what your songs are about, then you should probably go back and work on rewriting your lyrics. Um, uh, enough said. Okay, here's another one. Um, I can't remember the circumstance, but probably a week or two ago, somebody in the staff handed me something, it was probably a kind-hearted member sending something, you know, kid, would you mind giving a copy of this for Michael to hear for his own enjoyment? And it had four or five songs in there. And the lyric sheets were handwritten, um, not all that accurate as to the lyrics that were actually in the songs. Yes, I did listen um, and was sitting there scratching my head going, well, that's not what the lyrics said. And they were Xeroxed off and then folded up and there was no copyright date on there. There was no copyright anything on there. Um, there was no demarcation as to the intro, verse, or chorus, not that I couldn't figure it out. But just saying, handwritten lyrics in this day and age in any day and age, you know, past uh, ink and quill, handwritten lyrics, not good. Not going to help you. Uh, number 15, putting the words pre-release sneak peek on your CD cover. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the person whose CD that I saw that on was trying to give people some sense of, here you go, you're on the inside, you get the, I think this was handed out at the road rally, if I'm not, I think it was actually in my box of stuff collected at the road rally. And it said, pre-release sneak peek on the cover of the CD. Um, I just don't know what the exact motivation is, but again, it just, it's like, didn't need to be there. <clears throat> Hold on. This requires a sip of Rockstar. Um, okay, number 16. Handing material to somebody in the industry, and then as you hand them, I'm looking for a CD. I need a prop. Here you go. This isn't my best stuff. I'm working on that now. This is something I did a couple of years ago. <laughs> Never give them what isn't your best stuff. And certainly don't tell them it's not your best stuff. People in the industry don't want to hear your not best stuff. They want to hear your best stuff. So don't give them a CD and, or a thumb drive or what have you and say, or send a, you know an MP3 attached to an email and say, this is my best stuff. Uh-uh. Um, let's see. Oh, this was a doozy. I saw this one the other day. This was somebody that actually sent a resume to Taxi. 
um, wanting to work here on the staff. And <laughs> the bottom, all the way at the bottom, I believe, of the resume, or maybe the email that went along with it. I think it was the email in the signature area, you know, where you can say, you know, like Michael Lasko, CEO, Taxi Independent A&R, under your name. This person actually had sent from the yellow brick road on the way to see the wizard. I kid you not, it said sent from the yellow brick road on the way to see the wizard. I'm just curious, what would you guys think if you saw that? Let's find out. I see people talking about bacon, prosciutto, and beef jerky. Apparently the show is not that interesting today. But what would you think if you got a resume from somebody and their... Um, their email signature was sent from the yellow brick road on the way to see the wizard. Is it just me or would any of you have a reaction to that? I know it takes like 20 seconds. I'm waiting. Keep talking, Michael. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Micaiah says, I think the person was nuts and be scared. Uh, it's a bit rude because he's not taking you seriously, not so impressed, sounds cheesy. What were they smoking? Uh, sounds like a stoner. Yeah, you know, that's the impression I had is really, is this a person I want taking care of our members? Somebody who's going to write, sent from the yellow brick road on the way to see the wizard. And this person by looking at, you know, like dates that this person graduated college and such, I would guess this person was in their 40s. So it, it just seemed really like, I don't know, um, unprofessional at best. Uh, Adriana says I wouldn't hire them. Well, I didn't. Um, glad to say that. Okay, uh, number 18. I've, I've heard this one a lot. Doing an edit to create a buttoned ending is usually not a great idea. Um, most of the, the kind of made-up buttoned endings, a buttoned ending, um, which could also be called a stinger ending, you know, is something where it goes back to the root note. There, first of all, there's no fade. Fades are very unpopular right now, um, even in the record industry, fairly unpopular. Um, certainly for film and TV music, and most especially true for um, instrumental stuff. They want a hard ending so that they can cut on it and the note will trail off or the reverb will trail off as the scene edits to another scene, transitions to another scene. So I, I give people props for creating a buttoned ending where there wasn't one. Uh, my issue with it is that most people don't execute that really well. So what they'll do is they will just do a hard edit and, and just mute everything or cut off the audio after the last note um, and add reverb to it so that it trails off. But it just doesn't sound right because it wasn't meant to be that way. I've heard a few people pull it off pretty nicely. And when I used to do audio posts in New York, there were times, lots of times actually, that I had to simulate a buttoned ending and, and do that exact thing, which was find a good edit point and then add some reverb to it. But it, it takes a lot of skill. You've got to kind of match the level of the reverb and then time the decay of it, um, find a, a really good spot to do the edit on. It can be done. It's not that easy to do well. So if you're going to do it, Practice and do it really, really well, because I would say 95% of the time that I've heard those, they're bad enough where you get all the way to the end of the piece and then you go, oh, oh. Um, now you would think, gee, well, if the rest of the piece was so good, why wouldn't the music supervisor call that person up and go, I love that piece, I want to put it in the show, but you need to give me a buttoned ending. All right, no problem. I'll go remix it and get back to you in a couple of days. Well, no, I actually need it now. Um, I need it, you know, like tonight. Um, bottom line is they're not going to wait for you to go remix it. Um, it would be a very, I'll never say never, but it would be exceedingly rare that they would say, sure, go ahead and do that and get back to me because chances are they're up against a tight deadline. And, um, 
they just don't have the time to do that. So, uh, number 19. Um, this one I know I've talked about before on the show, and we see it all the time. Not including your contact info on the CD when you give it to somebody in the industry. Um, I know it sounds silly, it sounds unthinkable, you can't imagine that people do it, but we see it all the time. I, I saw this the other day when I was looking at that. I was looking for a particular CD and a stack of Road Rally stuff that I still had sitting here in my office with a post-it that said Road Rally stuff. And uh, there were a couple of them on there that had no contact info. It, it, one of them only had a song title. I didn't know who the artist was or how to reach that person. Uh, thankfully, I guess, it, it wasn't great. It was just okay. But if it was amazing, it would have really bothered me. Many, many, many years ago, probably the first year of Taxi, I got a cassette, um, and, and it was three women rapping and doing an a cappella song, clearly sitting at a kitchen table, playing hand drums on the table, doing a song called Girlfriend. And if I remember correctly, it only said, like, Mrs. Johnson on the cassette. It was just one of those cheap white shell cassettes, and it said, Girlfriend, Mrs. Johnson. There was no way to get back in touch with this person, and it was an amazing piece of music. I can't tell you how many times in my career that I've wished that I had that piece of music because it, it would have gotten used. It was that cool. So always make sure that the CD itself has your name, the song title, um, the copyright, and uh, copyright notice and your contact information, both uh, cell phone number and your email address. Now, number 20, and guess what? I have more than 20 of these. No surprise there. A little bonus round for you. Uh, number 20 is putting the info only on the CD itself. Um, looking around my desk to see if I've got one, but I don't see one within arm's length. Anyway, um, this happens a lot. Uh, I do tend to listen to music in my car. I've got a fairly short, like 10 to 15 minute commute going to and from work, and I will throw something in the CD player in my car and listen to it. And inevitably, I'll reach over to the passenger seat while I'm driving, shh, don't tell, and I pick up the CD cover because I'm going, I think that was the third song, what's that one called? And I glance down and there's nothing on there, uh, uh, you know, um, so you want the song list on the cover itself, not only on the CD, because once you slide the CD in that slot, that information can only be read one way, and that's by bringing it out of the slot. And the last thing you want is for somebody to stop listening to your music. You want them to keep going. Uh, okay, I think it was Bria who suggested this one. Uh, which, by the way, Bria is producing the show today and heading up the chat. So welcome, Bria. She's going to be doing it now. She's moving into more um, like marketing, social media, that kind of stuff at Taxi. So we're glad about that. And she will be your new uh, chat moderator. Uh, number 21, given to me by Bria, I believe, having a weird, strange voicemail message that's just out there some sort of inside joke that only your friends will get, which I get it, you know, probably 90% of the people that call you on your phone know you already, so they might think it's cute or funny. Um, 30 seconds, uh, I, I know a particular artist, uh, somebody who lives here in LA, I've known her forever and she's very talented and moderately successful as an indie, you know, working artist that plays gigs. Uh, but if you call her cell phone, you get about 30 seconds of the latest song that she's worked on before you hear the beep. Frankly, that's frustrating. Um, my wife's voicemail, when back in the very, I mean, we're talking probably 11 or 12 years ago, our daughter Hannah sang a cute little thing on my wife's voicemail. It's like, uh, Deborah's not home. She cannot get to the phone. Blah, 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 blah. And to this day, my wife still has that on her voicemail. It's only cute to Lasco family members or very close friends. And I would love it if my wife would take that off. But if I ever suggested it, she would hurt me. 
It would break her heart to take it off because she loves remembering her adorable little daughter Hannah when she was so cute, probably missing a couple teeth, and she sang that so well. But you know what? Sometimes people call my wife in a professional capacity and they have to hear that dopey message. So, honey, I hope you don't watch this episode because if you do, my dinner might be burnt tonight, right? <laughs> oh, no, I'm cooking tonight. Never mind. Um, number 22. This was also given to me by Bria. Having an industry or interrupting an industry pro who's already involved. She saw this one at the road ride where an industry pro is talking to a member and they are locked. They're doing the Vulcan mind meld. They are engrossed in conversation and um, somebody just walks up. And, and like butts right in and sticks the old CD out. Here, check out my CD. It's like, dude, you're interrupting them. You are certainly not ingratiating yourself uh, with that industry pro. Um, I think it makes you look really bad. Didn't your mama teach you any manners? So, you know what? It might take five minutes for the conversation to wrap up. Sit back, lay back. Oh, and don't do this thing where you're sitting. No, I can't really do it. And, and view the camera, but I see this happening all the time at the road rally to me, and I understand. I own taxi. I'm, in, you know, probably the most visible guy. I am the star of the road rally because I'm on the stage all the time in the grand ballroom. Everybody knows who I am, and well-wishing members. While I appreciate it so much, I really do. The people want to come up and introduce themselves. Uh, I love meeting members, especially members from the Midwest. I go, yeah, I grew up in a cornfield too, but when they're standing, uh, they like work themselves off to like where they're in your line of sight and you can see that they want to butt in and, and it's distracting you're trying to you know look at the person who you're speaking with and you see this other person kind of nudging their way in to get in your periphery or in your direct line of sight and it just doesn't make you love them so just lay back and wait till the person is done and then accost them um, calling to follow up when your music goes to somebody. I'm sure I've spoken about this on the show. And, you know, there are a couple of schools of thought. Uh, back in the days when it was primarily the record industry, um, people loved to call an A&R person, loved to call a publisher. Hey, you know, I sent you my cassette. I uh, wonder if you had a chance to open it. Have you had a chance to listen to it yet? And I will admit that I have seen um, half a dozen cases maybe in the 40 years I've been in the industry where the follow-up call, and we're talking a half a dozen in 40 years of being in the industry where the follow-up resulted in somebody going, you know what, I've got it sitting on my desk. I haven't opened it. Um, I will listen to it. And something happened because of that. As we've morphed, into um, film and TV being half of what we're pitching to. And I mean, we're collectively, you guys, us, everybody. Film and TV has become a very important uh, component in our world. So I was speaking with, maybe I asked this question. Frank Palazzolo is a music supervisor here in Los Angeles really, really, really good at what he does. The dude is intense, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean he works really hard, really fast. Any of you who were in the ballroom uh, to watch him do, uh, he did a presentation at last year's Road Rally about how he picks music, and he actually uh, was listening to taxi member music against a couple of scenes from big TV shows and showing how he listens to three or four seconds, then skips forward, then skips forward again. And um, he is intense. And I, again, I don't mean that to have any sort of negative connotation. He's just really, truly focused on his work. And he works long hours. And he probably works a lot of weekends as well. And I think I asked him um, publicly during that panel how he feels about follow-ups. He's like, dude, 
I don't have the time for that. Um, nothing worse than somebody following, you know, if you engage them, they're going to go, well, why aren't you using it? Or might you use it in another scene or another show? Or what was it about it that you didn't like? Uh, are you sure you didn't get the email? I sent it to you like two weeks ago. The subject line said, blah, blah, blah. Can you go check and see if you've got it? There are a million ways that interaction can go and barely any of them, if any of them, are going to be favorable for the person who is intensely busy on the receiving end. So while there was the slimmest of chance back in the day that it might help you get your thing noticed, nowadays it's almost strictly verboten. Um, number 24. This relates to the previous one. Asking somebody, especially a music supervisor, why your music didn't get used. Let's say that um, at last year's road rally, you accosted <laughs> in the kindest of ways um, Frank Palazzolo uh, coming out of the men's room and heading for the bar to grab a beer after he did his panel. And you walked up and said, hey, I really enjoyed your panel. Um, is it okay if I give you a CD? I've got some stuff that I think might be right for XYZ show that you're working on. And Frank, being the nice guy that he is, is let's say he said yes, and he took that CD. Now it's been a year later, and you see him again at the road rally. He comes off the stage, he's done a panel, he's heading out of the ballroom, and you run up to him. Hey, Frank, how you doing? Michael Lasko from Ottawa, Illinois. We met last year at the Road Rally, remember? And I gave you my CD with that song, uh, Mary Used to Love Me, uh, on it. Uh, uh, but, but you haven't used it for anything. Can you tell me why not? First of all, the timeline, obviously, being a year would just be ridiculous. Nobody would remember that. And frankly, I don't know that 15 minutes later or a half a day or a day or a week later is going to be much better because music supervisors listen to a ton of music, not just a little bit, not just a few, not many, but an almost inconceivable amount of music. And, and they don't memorize every title and remember every piece of music that they skimmed and checked out for the show and then remember what about that piece of music didn't work all they're going to remember is dude if i didn't use it it didn't work for one reason or another in the context of film and tv it's like it was too fast too slow didn't have the right mood didn't uh accentuate amplify or support the mood in the scene just didn't work that well against the picture which is usually the reason so they're not going to remember, and asking them is only going to kind of identify you as an amateur. Um, as a matter of fact, we just sent some music over to a big music supervisor a week ago. Um, found some incredibly good stuff, and as much as I, and it's somebody that I know, and I'm dying to call up and go, what did you think? Did you use any of it? But I'm not going to do it because we'll find out this person I happen to know pretty well. We'll find out if they do use it. Um, and, and that supervisor, even though we're pretty tight, would not appreciate a phone call or an email from me um, regarding that. Maybe anything. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we're not as good of friends as I think we are. Um, and last but not least, this is a big one. Don't lie and tell an industry person that my friend, John Krupek, told me, and I'm just making that name up. I, hopefully there's not a John Krupek out there. Um, I'm sure there is somewhere. My friend, John Krupek, told me to call you to see if you'd like to hear my music. And they people do that because they see a picture with let's say, a music supervisor or an A&R person standing there talking to somebody. Uh, they might see pictures of the road rally, and here's John Krupek and, you know, Anthony Doyle, music supervisor. So, um, or maybe, you know, John Krupek was a supervisor on the same panel as Anthony Doyle, another made-up name. Um, and they will, I've seen people do this. They've used my name. They've used Taxi. It's a, oh yeah, the people at Taxi told me you wanted to hear this, or the people at Taxi told me you should hear this, or Michael Lasko gave me your information and told me to send it to you. When it was a big fat lie. They found it by Googling. I had nothing to do with it. And then I get this pissed off phone call or email. It's like, dude, 
why are you giving out my information and having people send me this not so great music? And I'm going, what? What are you talking about? I, I, I don't even know who that is. So first of all, it's just not good to lie. Second of all, certainly not good to be, um, you know, to make up a lie that can come back and bite you on the butt when you get caught in it. Um, because in the case of one of those calls, I actually, uh, I've got a note, yeah, I could say, Tanvi, at, uh, one of my friends who's the head of a music library, and don't go blurting it out in the chat room, guys. Um, but uh, I got a call from Tanvi, who probably four or five years ago said, you know, so-and-so sent me this piece of music. I, I can't believe that you told them to send this to me. I hadn't. And did this person not think that, you know, she and I might figure this out? So she just does not ever want to work with that person because of this. I mean, if they'll lie about that, what else would they lie about? People want to work with good people. People want to work with people that are easy to work with. They certainly don't want to work with liars. So there you go. That is the list. And we still have a half hour left. Um, if you guys would like to ask me um, general questions. Hopefully some, if not all of those, were helpful to you. So let me take a swig of water and you guys can start firing in some questions if you have them. Question, any chance for an East Coast road rally in the future? Sadly, Ken, no, and here's why not. Um, the cost and logistics of taking a hundred different panelists and speakers and mentors, taking all those people cross country, the vast majority of them, some of them come in from the East Coast or Nashville to do the road rally, but the vast majority right here in our own backyard, so we don't have to pay airfare. So let's just multiply, let's say 90 people times, where's my calculator? 90 people times $400 a head for airfare equals, there's $36,000 just for airfare. Um, now let's say they each stay three nights in a hotel at 150 bucks a night, so that's 450. Tack on another 50 dollars for tax. I'm sure it's more than that, but that's 500 dollars per person um, times 90 people. So that's 45 thousand. So now we've got 45 thousand dollars plus 36 thousand dollars. So that just added $81,000 right there to the, to the cost of us putting on a road rally. And we do it for you guys for free. So either you can spend 400 bucks to come and enjoy this amazing event or not, but we can't move the event to the East Coast because we get asked this question, why don't you do it in Chicago? Why don't you do it in Dallas? Why don't you do it in Terre Haute, Indiana? We can't. Is, it's just financially and logistically. I mean, we, we take a 22-foot truck loaded with stuff. We'd have to haul that across country, blah, blah, blah. Um, Pedro Costa says, great list, Michael. Will you be publishing it on your website or on the forum? You know what? That's a great idea, Pedro. I will. Um, thank you for suggesting that. Um, Uh, Robbie Hancock says, question, any idea for a guest speaker at the rally this year, Michael? Um, are you asking if I know who the, um, like the keynote's going to be? And the answer is no, but I am starting to think about it and looking at my list of possibilities. Uh, Bob LaGrasso wants to know, Michael, shouldn't you try and build a rapport with your music library that you signed with? Um, to some extent, yes, but to a greater extent, uh, there's rapport and then there's, gee, uh, let's, let's take a small to mid-sized library that's got, let's say, 2,000 pieces of music in there. And let's say that the average composer has three pieces in there. So what's 2,000, love my calculator, 2,000 divided by three, that means that they've got 666 
0.66666 um, composers. Now let's say, so let's round that to 667 composers. And let's say that each of those checks in once a month and they each spend just five minutes, which we know is, it's going to be more than that, but just five minutes times um, 667 composers. So that is 3,335 minutes a month divided by 60 minutes in an hour. So that is almost 56 hours of phone time a month. Just to say a, a quick five minute, hey, how you doing? What's going on in your world? To a relatively small library with a relatively small batch of composers. So that's 56 hours a month um, divided by four weeks. So that's 14 hours a week of just, hi, how you doing? And trust me, there's not a library owner on the planet that wouldn't rather be spending those 14 hours a week. I mean, come on, that's like three hours of business day, almost. Two point something hours of business day. Um, let's find out. 14 divided by five equals 2.8 hours a day. So it's almost half a work day for them to do, hi, how you doing? Just to talk to each one of those people in just once a month for five minutes, um, they would much rather be spending that time pitching music. And wouldn't you rather have them pitching your music than saying hello to the other 667 people? I know everybody would like them to talk to me, but I mean you, myself, you know what I'm trying to say. But you've got to figure what's fair for you uh, is true for everybody else. So in theory, 667 people a month, that's, that's a lot of pitching time down the drain. Uh, all right, let me scroll down here. Um, question. Do all the rock tracks go to one screener, hip hops to another, pop to another, or do all the screeners listen to everything? Um, we have screener, all the screeners are genre specific experts, okay? Um, we actually have a thing called a depth chart, which shows us um, every screener what their number one genre is, what their number two genre is, what their number three genre is. Um, it's rare that we have anybody that does more than two or three genres. Many just do one genre really well. And we assign them according to the listing. You know, let's say it asks for rock. So only screeners that do rock. And we even go as far as only screeners that do rock instrumentals for film and TV. Now, sometimes it may make more sense to have somebody who used to work at a music library and understands the world of cues, instrumental cues, um, more than a rock specific person, uh, because a cue person will have broad ears for all genres within the realm of cues. OK, so it could go either one of those ways. But what will never happen is having somebody a country person screening your hip hop just doesn't happen, even when we're in a pinch, doesn't happen. Good question, though. Um, why not simulcast the road rally for those who can't make it? I could fly out of New York City, Philadelphia in a heartbeat, what won't have my day job when I get back. The reason that we don't simulcast it, first of all, is the cost of having um, cameramen on site for the weekend. Uh, last time I checked, it was about 20,000 bucks. It ain't cheap. Second of all, if we do simulcast it um, or broadcast, even doing it after the fact, making videos available, people will not get on airplanes and come out to the road rally. So we like to think of it as we are giving a special treat to the people who make the effort. And the special treat is there's much more to the road rally than just hearing the panels. First of all, got to know that when we're doing a panel, upstairs on the second floor, we've probably got, got 10 classes going on simultaneously. So, gee, do we do broadcast the panel? Do we broadcast the class? Hmm, I don't know. Um, and you know what? The biggest benefit of coming to the road rally is being able to pick and choose what you go to. You get to make up your own menu, so to speak, um, from an a la carte menu. And it's the networking. You know what? Um, you're not going to meet a music supervisor sitting at home watching a panel. 
and you're not going to have a beer with the music supervisor or a music library owner or an A&R person sitting at home. And that's the one thing we hear from people all the time is, God, I can't believe I haven't come to the Road Rally before. It's a networking bonanza. So those are just some of the many reasons um, that we don't do it. Um, what about mastering? Is it needed for some or all submissions? Ozone 7 advance is 500 bucks. I don't have. I used to say mastering wasn't all that critical. Um, can you imagine, certainly on the record side of things, people saying, gee, this sounds like a hit song, but it's not mastered, so therefore I'm not interested in having my artist cut it. Or this band is the most amazing band I've ever heard, but their stuff isn't mastered. I don't want to sign them. I still think those things are true, but yet there is a competitive aspect to having your music sound as punchy and good as everybody else's. It's, you know, in a comparative context. Um, but again, it is all about uh, the context. Uh, now, on a film and TV level, um, all library owners will tell you that they want the stuff mastered before it gets to them. But you know what? Many of them take stuff that's not mastered. Um, I know some libraries that go ahead and, and do kind of basic, you know, one button, push a button and master it kind of stuff. Um, it, it, you know what? There's so many different circumstances that are unique that it's impossible for me to really say. Um, if it's a heartfelt guitar, acoustic guitar vocal thing. Um, does it really need mastering? Probably not. Does it need to be mixed really well? Would it be nice, it, you know, if your um, compression, overall compression and your overall EQ sounds totally professional and really awesome? Yes. Um, if you're submitting a dance pop thing, uh, probably more likely, if you want to sound like it's going to sound on the radio, get it mastered. Um, and, and you know what? Um, Shirelli, Rob, my friend Rob Shirelli has um, a company called Final Mix, and he's got a plug-in that I heard. You guys might remember it, but it, it is basically um, a one button, one knob thing that just makes everything sound better. And it's like, I don't know, 15 bucks or 25 bucks or 30 bucks. It was really cheap and sounded really, really, really good. So if you can't afford it, you know what? $500 mastering tool in the hands of somebody that doesn't really understand what mastering does. Mastering is an art form. It is. Um, and I know my, I, I couldn't be a mastering engineer without you know, a couple of years of doing it to get good enough. You can't sit down with a piece of software in your own music and learn how to correctly and art, uh, expertly do mastering in a weekend. You just can't. Um, does anybody remember uh, what Shirelli's thing was called? I don't remember. Um, but go to finalmix.com. I think that's where you find it. Um, Jim Carvalho says Rob's Pultec uh, plugin is amazing. Yeah, you know, I gotta say, uh, look, Shirelli's my friend. Would I like him to sell more stuff and be successful? Not that he isn't already. Sure. But I'm not plugging his stuff because he makes a little extra money. I don't get anything for plugging it. And you guys know me, anybody who knows me well knows that I just don't do that. I don't get any kickbacks. I, I had somebody the other day offer me an amazing kickback to promote their thing to Taxi's members. And I said, no, you know, if it's something our members should know about, I'll tell them, but I, I can't take anything. I, I, I need my opinions to not be gauged by how much money I'm making. So the um, Shirelli stuff sounds really good. I hear nothing but great feedback. Um, Uh, Russell Landwehr is asking a young person, teenager, which is clearly not Russell, <laughs> who composes orchestral music very well, wants to take a shot at production music library business. What would you tell him is the starting place, the first steps he should take? <clears throat> the very first step 
anybody starting out, no matter what their age is, but especially a young person. And I think it's cool that somebody young is getting into it at a young age because that means that they can have a very long career ahead of them, uh, is watch a lot of TV. And I'm looking, here we go. Watch a lot of TV and keep one of these on your lap. A spiral bound notebook. Um, I guess you could do it with an iPad or a laptop and take notes. Just take notes about what kind of music um, you hear because that's the best way in the world to learn is to hear what they've already signed and how and what supervisors are using in the context they're using it in. Nothing will teach you more more quickly than just paying attention and taking notes. Um, here's a piece of tension music. Uh, uh, playing while the bachelor is deciding who gets the next rose. What about that tension music? You know, it, um, is it pizzicato? Is it legato? Is it electronic? Is it organic strings? Make any notes you can as fast as you can write or type. And after a while, you're going to start to see patterns forming. And those patterns will be so instructive as to what kind of music gets used the most frequently, um, the context of how it gets used. I wish every musician would spend just one hour a night watching different types of TV shows that use music that is the kind of music that you feel comfortable and adept at making. And the, the it's just like the blinders come off and everything will become so apparent. So do that. Um, Robbie Hancock says, watch a lot of taxi TV. Thank you, Robbie. Um, Mary Ben says, I'll watch Castle with a notepad tonight. There you go. We've had a lot of stuff uh, on Castle. What if you don't watch TV? you got to watch TV. That's like saying I want to have a float in the Rose Bowl parade, but I've never seen it. Sounds goofy, right? Um, you got to watch TV. Uh, you're, you're only hurting yourself by not watching TV. Force yourself. It, it, it's, it, it's part of the education. It's part of the cost of doing business. I mean, would you say, you know, I, I want to be a pro golfer. I never watch golf on TV. Or I never go to any matches or I want to be a pro basketball player, but I've never watched another team play. You got to watch. Um, Ken Potter wants to know, if I sign my version of a public domain piece to a library, should I still expect to get all of the writer's share? You know what? Um, I don't believe you do. There, I, I don't want to say anything incorrect, and, and I'm a little shaky on that question, honestly. Um, I know that you can get um, compensated in some way for your arrangement of a public domain piece, but I'm not sure what the percentages are, how you go about that. Um, looking for another question. How are we doing? Okay, we got 15 more minutes. Micaiah says she has to watch shows two times now, second time around to see what happened, actually happened in the show. I've been watching that new show, Billions, uh, almost at the end of its first season on Showtime. I love the music in that show. Um, I can't remember uh, the music supervisor's name. He's one of the great supervisors. I just can't think of his name. But amazing work, amazing show, amazing acting, amazing character development. Love that show. Can't say enough good stuff. Um, yeah, don't watch that show with the kids in the room. There is, is some stuff that's not appropriate for young people. Um, McGayeth wants to know, should we sign with SAG slash AFTRA to get vocal background residuals? Um, I'm not expert on that either, but to the best of my knowledge, having recorded a bunch of that stuff when I was in New York, um, singers on jingles made a ton of money back in the day. I don't know what the current rules and regs and payouts are these days, 
But yes, they were signed with SAG or AFTRA and they got paid and they did very well. So my inclination is to tell you yes. TuneUp says, I just can't watch TV. I have to turn my chair around and just listen to the music. That's a great idea. Tune Creator says he's been watching, or he or she has been watching Hogan's Heroes. Um, Tom Selden wants to know how to title two mixes of the same song. Well, for your internal purposes, doesn't matter. Um, it's just when you send it out to the industry, don't send it out with like mix number one to them. They just want to know that it's, you know, I love you, Mary, not I love you, Mary, mix number one. Um, but you should keep track um, of which mix that you sent them. Uh, Gary White says, watching too much TV might make a second guess and sound a little generic. Sadly, generic works. And I know that that flies in the face of everything that artistic people stand for. But you know what? Look at it this way. If your day job requires that you make music that's kind of generic, make it generic plus 15%. What can I do to be generic and palatable and desirable, but 15% cooler? without being overly complicated in your uh, writing or arrangement. Um, that's your day job. It beats digging ditches. It beats putting bolts on or, you know, nuts on a, a wheel on a car assembly line. It, it beats a lot of stuff. You can do all the creative artistic stuff you want in your own time. But if your day gig is making music uh, for TV or film, make whatever it is they need. Um, Whoops, Jesse just had a question and it just scrolled off. Question, please, exclamation point. Michael, my new house is unrecordable from highway sounds. I'm building a six by six recording booth in my room with bass traps and ceiling bends. Anything to look out for in the build? Um, yeah, you know what? Seal all, um, every seam with caulking. Um, around windows, uh, you'd be shocked how much, and doors, the door to the room, um, there are doors that have these things called drop seals that when the door closes, there's the door. Uh, and there's a little nib that sticks out right here. And when the door closes, it pushes little nibs and a thingamabob drops down and goes into a little groove. It's like a rubber seal that goes into a groove in the door's threshold. You would be shocked how much sound comes in around doors and around windows, even around um, AC outlets and light switches, um, holes for uh, cans in your ceiling. So seal all that stuff if you really want to take it to an extreme build um, boxes around the cans up in the ceiling. But those are the things that they do when they build really high-end pro studios. It's expensive. Um, or you could just move. Why did you buy a house next to a freeway, Jesse? <laughs> um, Jim Carvalho, what's the hottest listing you like right now? Just wondering. Um, a group of listings that we've been running there's somebody we know who is a music coordinator on a hit TV show. The, if the, I hope I'm not confusing listings or people, but pretty sure I'm right about this. Um, a lot of coordinators, they don't get paid a ton of money and they work on really big shows and they work their tushies off. But then um, they will do independent films because they're trying to earn their stripes as a supervisor and they like doing the artistic stuff like working on a film. Um, and it gives them a longer timeline. So 
they will run listings, which is really cool. We like the fact that we've built these relationships with some coordinators, and then they come to us when they're supervising a film. And they're very taxi friendly. And uh, I, I don't know. I, I like those listings for some reason. I'm, I, I see all listings before they go out. And for some reason, those always catch my eye. Um, oh, there's another group of listings, which we got very few submissions for. Um, we tried to change the wording uh, on some, or we're changing the wording on some going out in the future. But it, um, they're for a big radio conglomerate. And they're looking for music. Uh, I forget how it was worded before, and I don't have a set of listings sitting around here right now. But they're paying $500 to buy stuff that gets used in commercial music blocks. And you're going, huh? What's a commercial music block? Well, um, this is a huge, huge, maybe the biggest radio conglomerate out there. And they've got tons of internet stations. And they produce in-house advertisement. Uh, advertising. So um, let's say that you're watching in Peoria, Illinois, and there's a Cadillac dealership in Peoria, Illinois. Um, they may do produce for that Cadillac dealership. They, meaning the big conglomerate, um, might produce a local version of a Cadillac dealer commercial for this Cadillac dealer. And they need music for it. And traditionally, they've gone to libraries for that music, but they've now discovered Taxi, and they're willing to pay $500, and it's non-exclusive. You get to hold on to the piece of music. You retain all rights to the publishing, to the master, um, and they give you 500 bucks to license that music in that commercial, and it goes on the Internet. So we're doing a group of those. They're kind of coming out in dribs and drabs, but you know, probably in the neighborhood of five to ten in different genres and we're getting really low submissions on it. I think it's because people don't understand what a commercial advertising block is. All it means is they're in their studio at this big conglomerate. They are making commercials for their sponsors in different regions or local areas. So take the 500 bucks. Keep your music. Get it out there. Um, Oh, I gotta scroll down. Um, what are you listening to outside of taxi stuff? Honestly, I'm going through a dry spell right now. Um, what was I? I was listening to a new artist this weekend, and now I can't remember the artist's name. Um, what was I watching? I saw, oh man, I saw a really good documentary the other day, a music-related documentary, and I loved that. It was a, a bunch of old blues guys. Um, so anyway, the bottom line is my taste generally, the stuff that I listen to. And I don't listen to a lot of music outside of work because I, I, I'm working all the time when I'm listening to music. I can't just listen for enjoyment's sake. If I'm watching TV, my wife will tell you, I drive her nuts. I'm going, you know, what kind of placement was that? It was a background source placement, honey. Okay, can we watch the show now? Um, if I listen to music, I, I probably listen to nothing at all. I like peace and quiet in my car. Um, I occasionally listen to talk radio. Sometimes I'll listen to music, and if I do, it's probably something that I loved in my 20s. Eagles, Steely Dan, um, Beatles are a default band, obviously, for many of us. Um, that kind of stuff. But new music, uh, I'm trying to think. Oh, gosh, I can't think of his name. Oh, well, drawing a blank. But uh, somebody that I heard over this past weekend for the umpteenth time. Oh, uh, I hope Anthony's watching the show. Maybe he'll come down and tell me. Um, hang on a second. <laughs> Who's the artist that you saw in concert that I love? Gary Clark Jr. Thank you. <laughs> Gary Clark Jr. I am in love with Gary Clark Jr. Um, 
the, the guy's amazing. He, he's just plain amazing. If you have not checked him out, check him out. Uh, will we write you a song? Uh, Michael, 60 second tracks for the ads. Honestly, you'd have to look at the listing. I don't remember. Um, can we see a tour of the taxi headquarters someday again? Sure. That's a good idea. The only reason I worry is that the camera, I, I use a webcam that's better than the eyesight camera on my laptop, and I worry that it's going to fall off. But yeah, we'll, I'll find a way to do that. Um, yeah, Gary Clark Jr. Not that he hasn't been around for a while, but I think the guy, not enough people are paying attention to him. All right, a few more minutes, guys. A couple more questions, and here I'll scroll up, see if there's anything that I've missed. Um, how many submissions do you generally get for each listing? It's all across the board. Um, I would say that the range is anywhere from, you know, like 10 submissions on the skinny side up to several hundred on the fat side. How do you title a song to target a show without limiting other placement possibilities? Well, I wouldn't title the song like, um, let's say you're pitching something to Bizarre Foods, uh, Andrew Zimmern show on Food Network. I wouldn't title the song Bizarre Foods. Um, you might want to... You know, I, I don't think that I would call it sushi or sashimi either. Um, but you may want to call it, uh, on the spot here, trying to come up with a title, but like, you know, Asian Rain. Um, that would tell you that it's going to be light and delicate with an Asian influence. And it could be used in a sushi eating scene in Andrew Zimmern's show. Or it could be used in a love story that's taking place outside with cherry blossoms somewhere in Tokyo. So there you go. Hopefully that helps. Um, could we get more of a definition of contemporary? <sighs> contemporary is a moving target. Boy, if I could solve that problem, I, I would be very, very happy to. But, uh, you know, it, it's contemporary is whatever is on the radio now and try and think beyond that a little bit because whatever you're hearing on the radio now probably got signed a year or two ago. Um, and, and yes, you can always make an argument. Oh, I hear stuff that's very 80s influenced. I hear stuff that's very 70s influenced, 90s influenced. There are a couple of ways to think about that. There are things that are influenced that have little, you know, flavors of 70s, 80s, 90s, 60s, what have you in there. There are other things, shows that take place. Um, the TV show Vinyl that's on right now takes place, I think, in the probably the late 70s, early 80s. And they, they do use music that, um, they use a lot of stuff that are big hits that we know, but they use other stuff that's not. And so they need stuff that authentically is from that era, preferably. So even the recording quality sounds like that era. And, and believe it or not, it's really hard to fake it. Um, but contemporary is, uh, you know, people say, oh, I hate what's on the radio today. I don't listen to radio. And then they get really pissed off at us when we run a ton of listings and say, looking for contemporary country songs. Well, again, it's like saying, I don't watch TV, but I want to do music for TV. Um, I want to pitch my country songs and have one of my songs be a hit on the radio today, but I don't listen to radio. So you got to know what people are doing. What's contemporary? You have to. Um, I <laughs> like Ked Potter says vinyls mid seventies, which is when I started out in the industry, by the way, I think my first job was either 74, 75. Um, that was my era, absolutely. And the show is pretty accurate as to what life was like in the music industry back then. Trust me. <laughs> uh, I think you have to have 
sort of immerse yourself in the alas, make it what you listen to. I need to follow my own advice, <laughs> Bob Pori says. Yeah, you know, um, we started including, I don't know if you guys have noticed it or not, but in most cases, when we name the artist, we'll say artists like, parenthetically, but not limited to, because we found way too many members weren't submitting because they thought they had to have a song that was exactly like or very close to one of the three references. No, more often than not, they're looking for stuff that sounds like if I liked Aerosmith, I would also like this band or that band. Or if it was on a playlist with uh, Gary Clark Jr., you might also hear other artists like that. So it's in the ballpark of, in the wheelhouse of. Similar to, might be on a playlist with, but it's generally not they're looking for stuff that sounds like those three examples. We get frustrated by that. We think a lot of our really talented members are missing a lot of great submissions because they're just trying so hard to match exactly what the references are doing. Stephen Carey says, thank you, Michael. Taxi and Taxi TV are fantastic. We appreciate you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I, I'd love to hear that, not because I've got a huge ego, but believe me, for every one of you saying something nice, there are 25 people out there going, Taxi sucks. I was a member for a year and nothing happened for me. Uh, maybe it was the music. Um, going back to your do's and don'ts, uh, this is from TuneUp. Um, as a past backup musician, as a past backup musician, is it bad to say whom you have backed up? Um, Honestly, we see that a lot. You know, I sang vocals on the road um, with this band, or I was the guitar player in that band, or my group opened for, we had a lot of that, my band opened for somebody. Um, it's something, but nobody's going to say, gee, that guy opened for Springsteen. Um, I mean, it's impressive. You might be a little more inclined to listen, you know, if somebody opened for Springsteen, but there are a lot of bands that aren't as high up as Springsteen, whether you like him or not. Uh, you know, I open from trying to think of a, a band that's, I don't know. You know, we open for Wolf Mother. Um, not that they suck, but you know, they're not Springsteen. They're a big band, uh, relatively current. Um, I don't think people in the end, people are impressed by the music. Nobody ever got signed because of who they opened for. Now, you could be opening for an act and the band that you're opening for has people from the label in the audience and they see you, that could result. God, it just sounded like Bernie Sanders, the way I delivered that. Taxi TV rocks. I look forward to it every week. The only TV I watch. Thanks, Element. Uh... Mitcher says, thanks for working so hard for us. I learn something every time I watch. Thank you. I worked on the weekend on that list. Um, not surprising. I always work on the weekends. Um, anyway, all right. I should wrap this up. We're three minutes over. Thank you so much for paying attention. I hope you learned some great stuff this week. Um, I did reach out again to Chuck. Oh, Toon Creator just got Bobby's book today. Looking forward to reading it. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, I did reach out to Chuck Henry. I really want to do an episode where I go to his house and his studio and have him build a, uh, a hip-hop instrumental track that would be good for library or reality show placements. And he's really good at it, so I want you guys to see how he does it. Um, thank you all. Taxi is our drug of choice with beer and vodka. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, you guys crack me up. Um, all right. I will see you guys next week on another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Bye-bye, you guys. Keep that applause going. Yeah.